This is a quick video, uh, mainly just to answer a question a client posed us, which is actually a very interesting one. Um, the Well, actually, he was watching our YouTube channel and he's already got pre-filtration in front of his house, but now wants to add reverse osmosis, but preferably wants to do it without having to add a big tank and a, and a pump to the setup. Now, this is doable, but it is one of those more tricky DIY things and something that's easy to, to miss a step. So, what firstly, typically what you would use is you'd use the 4040 size RO membranes that on the lower energy side, in theory, they're rated for about 250 liters per hour. In practice, what we've seen is about 150 to 180 liters per hour is what you'd get if you're running sort of six to eight bar in, um, in practice and pressure wise. Then what you have with these membranes is you have two end you well, the membrane goes inside and then you have two end caps and you've basically got the in and out on both sides so if you come this side then the the first thing you'd you'd want in line is a solenoid valve uh, to be able to cut off completely the water supply to the unit there's then um two connections on the side the larger port is the drain side of the membrane and that's also the side you'd want to use for the incoming water the smaller port is your product water you can draw product water from either side in this example of set it up for the other side so you would just plug off the middle port which is the half inch port on this side and connect an electrical solenoid which is normally closed um, up to the incoming water from the pre-filtration system then we'd run through the membrane and then again on this side, we've got the same two connections. We've got a, a half inch connection, which is your product water, and a three quarter inch connection, which is then your waste water or um, drain water. So on the drain water side, this is a little bit optional, but it's better to have it. You'd also want a normally closed um, solenoid valve. The main reason why you would want to put one on the drain side is purely that each time the system turns on, it doesn't have to fill up all the membrane housings from scratch again, that the water actually stays in the system. Then after that, you want a valve to control your, um, your wastewater flow. Now, typically on the slightly smaller units, we get an adjustable valve like this. The reality is any valve that takes quite a few turns to go from open to close should work, because basically all you really want here is you want to be able to fairly accurately control the amount of um, water flow going to drain. Ideally, you'd want to put a, a flow meter in on this line and a flow meter in on the product water line. But typically in DIY setups, we don't, don't see people going for that. And they just tune them once and until it's correct. Then on the product water line, we'll get into the tuning in a little bit. You then go pretty much straight away into a non-return valve. And this is to prevent the water from the house flowing back through the RO membrane because it can potentially, especially if the solenoid is leaking or if there's no solenoid, go through the membrane, right through out to drain again. Then after the non-return, you would want a high pressure switch in the system. And that high pressure switch, um, you basically want to use that to control the two solenoid valves. So you want to wire up the switch that um, if, it's, if it's got sufficient pressure, it turns off the power to the solenoids if they're normally closed. And this will allow the feed water and the drain water to shut off on, on here. Otherwise, you'll, you'll just get water constantly running in through the membrane and out the drain. And then you end up wasting a massive amount of water. So that solenoid is very important. And ideally what you want, I, I just took to grab the small one here. But as you'd want to get a high pressure switch like you'd use on the industrial RO's, which you can actually set the amount of pressure differential it allows. So that in effect, what you want is, let's say you set the house's pressure to six bar, then you would want it to run, um, let the system run up until you have six bar pressure on the product water side, assuming you have something like eight bar on the incoming side, because you're always going to get quite a significant pressure drop over the membrane and then allow it say three bar drop before it turns turns back on and opens the solenoid valves to allow water to flow to, to fill it again. Now, the problem with the RO membrane is the first bit of water you get out of it tends to be very near to the incoming water's mineral content. So if you are going to basically be switching it on and off, on and off, on and off, it's 
very inefficient and it doesn't really do that good of a job. So to get around that problem, what you would want to do next is you'd want to T into a pressurized buffer tank. This specific unit is a 150 litre unit, if I'm not mistaken. And um, that just gives you a buffer for the, for the RO not to be switching on and off, on and off, on and off. It allows you to, um, for let's say you're running a washing machine or a dishwasher, it would probably just take some water out of the, out of the buffer tank and not actually cycle, um, cycle the whole system on and off. Okay, then the next thing after this is ideally you would want a, a pressure regulator or at least the pressure relief valve. And the problem with this is wherever you have a non-return in line, um, as, a, as a, uh, a geyser or any kind of hot water system heats up, it, if it gets to a point where it starts to generate a bit of steam, it builds up pressure and that pressure needs somewhere to be released. And um, something like this, this buffer tank, for example, would absorb it, but it would keep that pressure in the system and that could damage appliances or your, or your hot water system. So you'd want something in line here just for, as that pressure builds up, say over six bar, just to release the, release the pressure if your hot water system is connected to it. Okay, then there's two things that you need to check and set up on a system like this. The first, is, the, the first thing is to actually get your tank set up correctly. Now these tanks, um, let's say you have a lower pressure like a six bar feed on your in incoming line, you're probably only going to get three to four bar pressure on your um, product water side. Now these tanks, whether it's a big one like this or a small one on a domestic aura, they would all typically have a connection for air because the way the tank works <laughs> is you've basically got a bladder um, splitting the water and the air and the water compresses the air and that's actually what gives you the force to sort of push the water back out. That's why there's only one pipe connected to the system. So what, what you need to check this is plain and simply a little pressure gauge and check it before you put any, any water in. Like this tank, because it's one of the larger ones which is typically used in industrial applications, um, is preloaded to 3 bar or um, uh, 200 psi, which for a setup like this would be too high because what the, the water won't be able to compress the air much. So let's say you're only getting 4 bar pressure through after the membrane, you probably want to lower this um, down to about 1 bar, which is what, I think 14.7 psi, so we don't really use psi much. Um, so you definitely want to take some air out of the tank, but not all the way. And the important thing is when you're setting this pressure is to do it while there's no water in the tank at all. If you then get the setup up and running and you measure, then you can actually measure your water pressure here just with a normal tire pressure gauge, because that, that will tell you what is the, the pressure on the product water side of the membrane. Um, if you're finding that um, you're only about double the pressure of the air bladder inside, you could probably let out some more air. Um, you can normally easily go to about three times the, the pressure of the air bladder inside to give you an idea. Um, 0.7 to 0.8 bar works quite well with, with about a, a 3 to 4 bar feed. So that's, depending on how you set the pressure, that will determine how much water is actually stored in, the, in this tank. So that's the one side of, side of the setup that needs to be looked at. The other side, you will need just a small handheld TDS meter that, or a conductivity meter. And what this is, is to be able to set up this membrane correctly. Now, what your readings will be will completely depend on what your source water, in, what your incoming mineral content basically is and what the makeup of that mineral content is. But the basic concept is you want to take a reading of your source water and then try to set this at a, at a ratio what um, the easy place to start is a one-to-one -one ratio. You can normally get quite, bit, quite a bit better than that, but for one part waste water, one, one part product water in a domestic setup, easy way to do it is let the drain and a tap which is connected to the other side, let it completely empty on this side so you have no water there, and then let a tap run into a bucket, let this run into a bucket, and compare the ratio of water you get and then measure the mineral content on the product water side. Ideally, you want to 
let it run a bit, let it run if the membranes have already been flushed probably about 50 liters before you take the measurement. Initially when you put in new membranes you're going to want to flush them, they're typically stored in formaldehyde so that's almost, it's, a, it's got a bit of a bitter taste to it and it almost looks like a little bit of an oily layer so you want to make sure that's flushed off first before you start taking any of the readings. Now theoretically let's say you've done this and the membrane's flushed and you've run your 50 liters or so through and you measure the mineral content let's say you have an incoming content of 300 parts per million and you measure 10 parts per million at the tap then you've got a good baseline to compare to then what you can start doing is you can start closing the wastewater valve and see what at what ratio that do you find the mineral content is starting to climb and then go back a little bit from there so you always you what you want is you want enough water flowing on the waste side that the mineral content and the product water side stays stable. So let's see, let's say you've gone from a one-to-one -one ratio to a one part product water and four parts, oh, sorry, one part um, wastewater and four parts product water. And then you measure it and you see, oh, okay, we're now at 20 parts per minute. And then you um, let it run for a little bit and then you see, oh, now we're at 25 parts per minute. Then you know you've gone too far. Then you need to actually go back a bit and um, and set your your ratio a bit lower maybe try a three to one ratio or a two to one ratio until you're not getting that creep of tds where the mineral content isn't climbing constantly what you'll find is as the membranes get dirty over time that will naturally climb and then it will typically require flush and for that you'd want to open your drain valve and flush a lot of water through it just to get rid of any scale buildup on the membranes. If, um, if this doesn't help, you probably need to chemically clean the membranes, but that's a whole different topic which we can cover in a different video. But yeah, that's basically what you would need to do to set, set up something like this for a, for a house.